Eli the Pliable. By way of introduction, a word of explanation about this series of addresses. They are not concerned to go through the historical details rela relating to each character. They are not concerned to examine the narrative step by step. That may be a very interesting exercise on some other occasion, but not now. Now, we are concerned to try to form an estimation of the characters of these Bible people, to some extent reading between the lines and looking behind the page. We shall, of course, have to look at some of the things that were said and done in order to come to a conclusion. But I stress it is not a complete historical review, more an insight into the hearts and minds of the characters who move through the Old Testament in such a fascinating way in the times of David. So, notwithstanding what I have just said, I want to remind you very briefly of the story of Eli. Not because I think you do not know it, I am sure you do, but it will help to set the atmosphere into which we have to move in order to consider Eli the Pliable. Eli was a high priest of Israel and also a judge. That is, a ruler of the people, and he followed Samson in the line of judges about 1170 B.C. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they were no good. Sons of Belial, the Bible calls them. They stole the offerings before they were presented in the tabernacle, and they seduced the women who came to worship. Eli remonstrated with his sons about their pernicious and evil life, but they disregarded him, and he appeared to be powerless. God sent a message to Eli, telling him of the downfall of his house, and how that he would be deposed, and that God would provide another priest in Israel. Eli accepted God's judgment, and at last, in the time when Israel was at war with the Philistines, Eli's sons took the Ark of the Covenant with them into the battle to save themselves. It was of no avail. They were killed, and the Ark was captured. When Eli received the news of his son's death, and that the Ark had been captured by the Philistines, he fell down dead. He had a great reverence for the ark of God all his life. And when it departed from Israel, it seems that Eli's life departed with it. That then, very briefly, is the story of Eli as it emerges in the Old Testament. What we have to do now is to think about his character. And at the beginning, that means thinking about 1 Samuel chapter 3 and one interesting feature which arises out of the narrative, namely the remarkable series of contrasts which arise from the association of Eli and Samuel. First of all, there is the contrast of age. One, a very old man, the other, a young boy. And is it not a strange and startling thing, this friendship between one so old and the other so young? And furthermore, that this friendship was possible, that the peculiar characteristics of one were not dulled or repelled by the other. I put it to you that it was not just a relationship of child, childhood and old age, like a grandson with his grandfather, not just a relationship of teacher and pupil, but more. It was a relationship of friend to friend. 
you will remember that Samuel thinks carefully and thankfully of what he shall say to Eli and then speaks to him honestly the unpleasant truth as a man does face to face with his friend. Is it not remarkable for one so young and one so old? The second contrast is in the very office they each bear. Remember, both are judges of Israel. But Eli is a judge coming to the end of his career, giving up his office, whereas Samuel is a judge about to enter upon his high and holy career. And here is a feature to mark. Eli finds himself in unusual and painful circumstances. God's judgment of his own life and his family's life he receives from the lips of the child he has taught and the friend he has loved. The old man hears the word of God out of the mouth of this young boy. The man who has been a judge for forty years is in a sense sentenced by the judge elect. And then notice also this. The inferiority is not on the side we might expect. Instead of the old counseling, guiding, supporting the young, it is the other way round. If I may borrow a figure, it is not the old wall which keeps up the creaking ivy, it is the very ivy itself which sustains the falling wall. The third contrast is in the nature of the appointment to be a judge of Israel. In the early days of the judges of Israel, we find men raised up separately, one by one, for this great office. Raised up by God as the need arose. Gideon, Abimelech, Jephthah, men who proved themselves to be fit to rule and were regarded as divinely appointed to their high calling. But later on, it appears that the qualification for the office of judge came to be an hereditary thing. The judge's son took his father's office. It was not given him because he was the best qualified or the strongest character, but simply that he was his father's son. This seems to be Eli's chief qualification. He was born to the office of high priest and therefore was also judge. Now, the hereditary principle has certain things to commend it, for without it, human society could well run into inextricable confusion. The principle operates in the Bible with divine approval. The hereditary succession in Israel was an established order, and yet, from time to time, God kept aside this arrangement in order to reveal that the heavenly order is more true than merely human inheritance. But, all the king, chosen by God and appointed by universal choice of the nation, is set aside by David, a man after God's own heart. Thus, the hereditary high priests in the valid line of Aaron are set aside for the introduction of another line of priests, not of the tribe of Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ himself being the great high priest of the universe. When this happens, as it has in the past, the contrast between what was 
and what is now become sharper and clearer. And so it was in the case of Eli and Samuel. Eli, the judge by succession, is set aside in favor of Samuel, the judge, by God's election. Eli, qualified by natural descent, Samuel, qualified by wisdom, insight, and will. Chosen to guide and judge God's people. It is in this situation that we are best able to formulate an estimation of Eli the man and the judge. It is in the wine press of these circumstances that the inwardness of Eli is pressed out. As it is the case sometimes, perhaps very often, there are two sides to the character of Eli. Let us think of the bright side first. The first thing about Eli to which I draw your attention is the absence in him of envy. Circumstances make it that Eli is used in the cause of furthering the advancement of Samuel to the detriment of Eli, and he does it without any sign of jealousy or envy. Let us face it, for many people this would be a very mortifying thing to have to bear. After all, Eli was the one in Israel to whom we might expect any revelation from God would have been made. He was God's priest and God's judge, and therefore the one called to receive God's message. But another is chosen. The inspiration comes to Samuel, and Eli is set aside. And the very circumstances themselves seem to add bitterness to the situation. God's message for Israel comes to a boy, to one who has been a pupil of Eli, who has done servile service for the high priest. And yet Eli is not bitter. Instead, he assists Samuel to attain his high calling. He does not complain petulantly, as some would have done under similar circumstances. Let your imagination work for a moment. Imagine what some would have said. Then let this favored child find out for himself. He will get no help from me. Can you not hear it? But instead, Eli guides Samuel faithfully and takes him to the place where he may speak with God to be invested with the order which Eli himself is losing. In order to assess the absence of envy in Eli, we can pause to think of the feelings of this situation. We must be honest with ourselves for a moment. Think how difficult it is sometimes to be surpassed and outstripped by a younger person whose superior we thought we were, and to bear it with good and sweet temper. It could be at work or it could be in the ecclesia. How hard it is even to be put right by someone who we think is our inferior and to take it with loving kindness and beauty. How often in human life is merit encompassed about with jealousy. How rarely is there genuine enthusiasm or even fairness for those who supersede others when the others are envious and jealous of the preferment. In these circumstances, have you noticed how easily men deprecate their rivals by coldness or indifference 
or even a sneer. They cannot with open heart and honest mind contest the merit and assist the advancement. They will not openly attack, but will secretly do their best to hinder the cause. I have seen it, my brethren, the emphatic silence, the shrug of the shoulders, the shaking of the head. Or think of this, how rarely will a man pass on to his rival some benefit he cannot use himself. How rarely do men go out of their way to ensure that the luster may shine truly on the one who deserves it, if it may mean some loss or deferment for themselves. Ponder these things. Think of your own feelings and then dwell on what Eli did. His was no ordinary act. He came to the test and was faithful. He was utterly fair and just. He threw no petty hindrances in the way of Samuel. In fact, he removed them. This is a fine thing to see in the character of Eli. Notice this next, the absence in Eli's character of any priestly pretension. How natural it would have been for Eli to have adopted a priestly authority and used a priestly tone. Think of Caiaphas later on. Eli might have picked Samuel with his eye and told him bluntly not to be presumptuous. Or he might have said, as many would, this is mere excitement. You have been overdoing it, my child. I am the appointed channel. I am the high priest. You, after all, are but a boy, unordained. Unreminded. In the world of priests, a layman has no right to hear voices. A boy cannot speak with Yahweh. Eli might have done this, and he would have done what tens of thousands of people have done in similar circumstances. Thousands of times, men have called what was true insight irregular enthusiasm and have condemned it. Thousands of times those in high places have rejected the unorthodox and branded it as mere dissent in order to protect their own authority. Eli could have done it, but he did not. Another thing Eli could have done was to receive Samuel's word and then put upon it Eli's own interpretation. The authoritative voice of the priesthood, the only explanation, the ex cathedra definition. Eli did none of these things. He sent Samuel to God. He did not try to pass over the experience, nor force his own interpretation upon it. He took great care to put Samuel into direct communication with Yahweh so that he could listen to the truth independently of Eli. Not to keep Samuel in leading strings, but to enable him to walk with God alone, freely and unhindered. Some people have thought of leadership as the opportunity to rule men's spirits, to settle every question, to exhaust every subject, to leave every avenue bare, so that there is no more need for thought, for development, for inquiry. To drill hearts and minds and consciences 
into intractable ways and thinking, and thinking into mental postures from which they cannot escape. Even in the truth, sometimes these attitudes emerge. But it is not sound leadership, nor would it be true priesthood. Every true priest is called to lead men to God, to hear his voice, to open their eyes that they may seek for the truth themselves and finding it true may be convicted. You cannot enforce belief. One man's faith is not sufficient for two. Eli did this part of his work faithfully. Guided Samuel, trained his character, but did not seek to put himself in the place of God. In effect, he confessed, I am not God's voice. I may be mistaken. Only God is true. My task is complete when your ear is open. And so there came to Samuel a calling which was to supersede that of Eli, and yet Eli had not lived in vain. And so there came to Samuel a calling which was to supersede that of Eli, and yet Eli had not lived in vain to bring a soul to God and to high and holy office and in the doing of it to achieve self-effacement is no mean thing. This Eli did. Notice another thing. That persistent resolve in Eli to know the truth and to accept it. Come what may. Remember again, 1 Samuel 3, verses 16 to 18. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son? He answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every whit, and hid nothing from him. And Eli said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. So Eli asked in earnest, in earnest, to know the truth, and if need be, to know the word. It is always a blessed thing to know the truth about ourselves. It may not be pleasant, but in the long run it is best. It tends to keep us humble when good and bad are known alike to us. Even the worst slander may have a bit of truth in it which may help us when the smart has passed. So it is a great blessing to have a friend like Samuel because it is one of the signs of true friendship to be able to speak the truth even when it is not pleasant and know that it will be received in love. In my experience in the faith, I have seen the truth so wrapped up and twisted in the name of love that at last it became half false, and those who might have benefited from a frank exposure to the reality instead were cozily encouraged in that which was wrong. What would be good for all of us, I suspect, is one friend who will tell us the worst and extenuate nothing if it is necessary. If when this meeting is over, you sit down to make a list of those who you know as friends who would honestly tell you the truth every whit, I doubt if you will get writer's cramp. 
being able to receive such frankness humbly and lovingly is something to be sought after. And it was in Eli. He said, It is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. It was a brave sentence. After all, what more can a man do but surrender to the will of God? So then, as we look at the bright side of Eli's character, we can mark these things to be admired. Freedom from envy and jealousy. Freedom from pretension. Submission which was earnest and humble. I look at Eli and think of these things and confess how glad I would be if these judgments were true in myself. I'm going to pause there to give you a rest and myself and we're going to sing together in 285. Ye servants of the Lord, each in his calling wait, observant of his heavenly word, and watchful at his gate. that marks out the difference between one man and another in the final analysis when all is said and done. What is it? It is not knowledge, nor opinion, nor devotion, nor feeling. In the end, in the final analysis, it is will, the power to act and to be. What matters it if one man's opinion is different from another if neither acts upon it? What matters it if one man's feelings and another man's feelings are different if neither are expressed in sympathy and goodness? In the ultimate assessment a man is or he is not 
He does or he does not. Over 35 years of being a recording brother, I am most impressed by what people do, not what they say. Finally, the truth is revealed in the will. Eli was humble, submissive, without envy, but he was in some respect feeble, wavering, irresolute, powerless. He lacked will. Why was he so feeble and therefore so pliable? I offer two reasons. You must ponder them and judge them. He was a recluse. He lived in the tabernacle always. This no doubt fitted him to offer sacrifices and to attend to ceremonies, but in a sense it unfitted him for life. He was no judge of other men's feelings or character. He knew little of the reality of life in the world outside. When Hannah came into his presence in the agony of prayer, he misjudged her. He mistook the earnestness of her pleading for the trembling of intoxication. He was not able to rule his own household. He seems to be a shy, solitary, amiable man an ecclesiastic and a recluse. There are those who look upon life from a cloister and walk with blinkers on and never know what living truly in a world of complexity is really like. They know nothing of experience save what they read about it. They keep aloof from the throb and sob of daily living. Now we know well enough that there is a danger in knowing the world too well or in the wrong way. But in my judgment of the two extremes, the worst is knowing the world too little. I know that what I am going to say now would almost certainly be challenged by some. But as it appears to me, true spirituality will not best be secured by locking a man up in a monastery and leaving him to meditate and nothing else. Severed from human sympathies, separated from men, cut off from human affection and human opposition, mistaking a narrow cloister for the world, it is possible to become dislocated and enfeebled. I propose to you that in some way Eli suffered from this disability, devout but incompetent in life. The things which develop strength of character Eli had not met and had not therefore overcome. Sometimes you find people who are gentle and without jealousy and at the same time are feeble. Let me illustrate what I mean. A man may be forgiving to his son because he is unable to feel strongly the viciousness of sin. Free from jealousy indeed, but because he has no keen affection. Submissive indeed, but was it to some extent because he was too indolent to be rebellious? It is, no great it is no great credit to a man without love that he is not jealous. The wives and the sweethearts in this house today would be dismayed if they found that the love of their loved ones was so feeble that it could never be provoked to jealousy. Some men have not strength enough to be passionate. Sometimes proud men are too proud even to be vain. It seems to me that Eli's virtues were those of a negative character. 
His mind was made up for him by the inevitability of the circumstances, and he found no place for jealousy and no feeling of rebellion. When people said to him, you should reprove your son, he does it, but not very strongly. When it is said you must die, he can make up his mind to die. He seems to bend easily to the forces which bore upon him. He was pliable. This then is the first reason for his weakness. He was a recluse. The second reason seems to me to be that somewhere in the very center of Eli's nature there was something which was impervious to every kind of experience. He was twice warned, once by the man of God as recorded in 1 Samuel 2 from verse 27 onward, and once by Samuel as we have read today in 1 Samuel 3. I am actually going to read a short portion from 1 Samuel 2 beginning at verse 27. And there came the man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore pick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honoreth thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat to the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Wherefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that thy house, the house of thy father, should walk before me forever. But now, the Lord says, be it far from me, for them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Eli answered submissively, but he did not change. He used strong language, but was weak in action. It looked as though a true reformation was about to be realized, but both times the warning was in vain. There are those who are so often like this, failing and sorrowing. They go through life like this, failing and then sorrowing, failing and then sorrowing. And no kind of experience ever seems to change them. Where they went wrong before, they go wrong again, time and again. They curse themselves and repent with tears and eloquent regret and are just the same the next time. It does seem as though somehow there is this strange element of character which can be disturbed and momentarily reshaped, and then left to itself, it returns to its own shape and its own design, molded by circumstances instead of molding them, always pliable in the wrong way. Notice the result of Eli's weakness. He was despised by his son. He was not held in very great esteem by the nation. He lacked influence. It looks as though at last only one stayed with him to the end. It was his friend Samuel. Do you not think that after all the secret of influence is not goodness or badness in themselves but will? In the end it is something you cannot counterfeit. You may speak strongly and vehemently and people do this sometimes when they are most conscious of their own vacillation. But if you never act strongly, at last you have lost your influence. A man who talks about the truth, but never really does it, in a way he makes it false for himself. 
men who commit themselves to hasty resolutions that have no real resolve are men without influence in the end. The other result of Eli's character was this. It did bring harm to others. Those sons of Eli grew up to be the plague of the nation. They sacked the moral standards of the people around them. They degraded the holy ministry of the priesthood. Remember verse 17 of 1 Samuel 2. And the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. In chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, you will read how the armies of Israel fled before their enemies. In a sense, all this stems from the weakness of Eli. How shall we form our assessment of this priest and judge of Israel? He was a man with good feelings and good intentions, submissive, free from the spirit of self-glory, without jealousy, and yet all this was mixed with one fatal ingredient in his character. He was weak of will, irresolute, and procrastinating, a man who meant well, but somehow did not do well. His weakness in another might not have been so serious, but in a judge and priest of Israel, it was the cause of restlessness and failure among the people of God. The narrative of Eli leaves me with a sense of sadness, and the sadness has its roots in the realization of one thing, how irreparable the past can sometimes be. Life is transient and passing, but what we do is permanent. Whichever way it is, good or bad, everything is going. It is fleeting and withering, but some things abide, and they are the things which we do. Permission or omission, these remain. Last time I was with you, I said that through the ages, what we have done for God will either be destroyed by the judgment of fire or else it will be transmuted into permanence by the same fire. But I know I hardly convince you. Weakness is a curse. Piety on crutches is rarely any good. Sometimes the indeterminate will is as dangerous as the obstinacy of rock-like obsession. All this leaves us with one question for ourselves. To what extent Eli lives again 